The U.S. railroads perform an important service. However, they generally fall short of providing all of the services of which rail transportation is capable. This is a little reality check. Railroads are a business. The purpose of a business is to make money. Rail transportation and a railroad business are not necessarily the same thing, partially because the playing field is not exactly level. Here is an aerial photograph of a typical port area. The railroad purchased its property and constructed its own line into the port. Trains operate at 5 to 10 miles per hour for a couple of miles in advance of arriving at the port. The highway was a government project. Trucks proceed at 25 to 50 miles per hour, with the 25 occurring just only a few blocks short of entering the port. To start a transportation business, you need to buy an airplane, or some trucks, or maybe a ship, and you're pretty much good to go, unless you want to start a rail transportation business. Mm, then you need to buy some property, and some track, and signals, and protection for the public, and track maintenance machinery, and some type of a control location, and of course, locomotives and cars. Then you're pretty well set to go. The difference in the cost to start and operate a transportation business has a substantial effect on the railroad industry. The U.S. railroad industry prefers and is very good at grain, coal, garbage, marine containers, and now unit oil trains, all of which weigh a lot and do not require fast or precise transportation. These are all important and environmentally friendly activities. There is no doubt that the railroad industry in the U.S. is an important element in a sustainable future, but... The need to overcome the great cost associated with the railroad business and make a profit means that the industry doesn't particularly care for passenger trains and freight from small shippers. To make full use of the environmentally friendly characteristics of rail transportation, we must make substantial changes in the economic and political environment that affects rail transportation. In the U.S., we tend to draw a line between freight railroads and passenger railroads. The difference is not generally technical, it's economic and political. Among the passenger services, we tend to draw a line between commuter and corridor regional and long distance trains. Again, the difference is political and economic, not technical. Many infrastructure projects that improve freight operation are funded as and identified as passenger projects. Railroads cannot say that they need any infrastructure improvements. Wall Street will be upset. Railroads cannot say that the improvements needed for passenger service help them. The public will expect them to pay. If they pay, Wall Street will be upset. Railroads cannot say that they can accommodate even a minimal passenger service without infrastructure improvement, even if it can be accommodated. Wall Street will be upset, and the public will expect that more can be accommodated at no cost, which will make Wall Street even more upset. Railroads own the infrastructure, so the public considers it to be a for-profit corporate infrastructure that the public should not spend on. Truck, barge, and airplane operators do not own the infrastructure, so the public does not consider it to be a for-profit corporate infrastructure and has no problem spending money on improvements. This situation is not consistent with a sustainable, energy-independent, safe transportation. A rich and powerful modern country, um, that would be the U.S., by the way, should have modern rail infrastructure and all the rail service benefits that go with it. How did we get here? For the answer to that question, we have to look back, way back to 1787. The U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, authorizes Congress to establish post offices and post roads. A U.S. Supreme Court decision interpreted this to mean roads that could also be used for other concurrent purposes. When it became apparent that railroads would become a viable transportation form, an 1838 law designated all existing and future railroads as post roads. In 1862, Congress used this power to fund, through land grants and bonds, the construction of a transcontinental railroad. 
Congress subsequently funded two other transcontinental railroads, a northern and southern route, flanking the central route that was established by the original legislation. This arrangement worked out well for the U.S. government. The government had acquired a vast amount of western land that was virtually worthless because of a lack of transportation. Railroads were the best kind of transportation for such a vast space, and it was really easy to grant the railroads undeveloped property that wouldn't be worth a thing without transportation in order to pay them to develop the transportation that would make their property worthwhile. Kind of a Ponzi scheme in a way. So what went wrong? Ultimately, after a lot of people lost everything they had trying to develop the railroad business, railroads made some people rich and powerful, and that would just not do. The Interstate Commerce Act of 1887 created the Interstate Commerce Commission. From 1887 until 1980, ICC regulated railroad rates, generally keeping them as close to cost as possible. In that time, ICC regulatory practices were instrumental in the bankruptcy of virtually every U.S. railroad at least once, the Panic of 1907, the deterioration and elimination of U.S. railroad infrastructure, and promoting the idea that railroads were a bad thing, leading eventually to the U.S. government directly competing with the railroad industry by establishing greatly improved highway and air transport with the encouragement of some folks who sell highway vehicles and oil. Entry into World War I made ICC determine that railroads were important and the government should control them, so USRA was formed to nationalize the railroads. Nationalization lasted from 1917 to 1920. Railroads were not in good condition, partially due to ICC regulation, so making the newly nationalized railway system functional was very expensive. Nationalization was successful in some ways, not in others, and in 1920 the railroads were returned to their owners. ICC returned to its previous methods, and the story started all over again. This is an engine of war. Long before Pearl Harbor, the American railroads, ever conscious of the gathering clouds of conflict, worked out a plan of unified and immediate action should this nation be forced to accept the challenge of aggression. To their everlasting credit, this careful planning was not to be in vain, for suddenly the infamous blow was struck. And overnight, engines of peace and progress were transformed into engines of war in a conflict unparalleled in the annals of human history. The die had been cast the decencies of mankind were the stake, and squarely upon the success or failure of the American railroads rested the fate of the nation, for only that nation possessed of adequate rail transport could hope to survive the ordeal of total war. But did this nation possess adequate transport facilities? Would the American railroads meet the strain of wartime traffic without delay or confusion? Railroad men know their jobs. They know those jobs well. In the first months of this globe-encircling conflict, they moved more men and more equipment, and with greater speed and efficiency than during the entire span of World War I. Yes, the wheels of war are rolling, and there is no longer any question as to the ability or the determination of the American railroads to shoulder their share of the nation's tremendous war effort. Their achievements furnish the unalterable proof. But great as is the demand for the movement of troops and equipment, it still remains only a small part of the real job the railroads are doing. A job so big as to be almost beyond the bounds of human comprehension. The day-by-day -day mass movement of freight. Only a few years ago, there were those who said the railroads were through, that they belonged to an era fast receding. Well, today, they are literally the lifeline of America. And every day, more than 40,000 trains are started moving. 
with Santa Fe alone operating as many as 1,800 trains every 24 hours. That's more than 75 trains an hour, a train every 48 seconds of the day and night to sustain the life and economy on the home front, meanwhile meeting the heavy demands of the nation's war effort. An aircraft factory requires vital parts to maintain production schedules. It's up to the railroads to get them there without delay. A shipyard is running short of steel plate. It's up to the railroads to get it there. There is an acute food shortage in an overcrowded defense area. It's up to the railroads. Well, you heard the man. Railroads were important. The government heard that, too. But having learned from the USRA experiment that restoring the rail system was an expensive task, the U.S. government left transportation for the support of World War II up to the railroads. The railroads performed admirably, pretty much like the guy said in the video. Their performance was not without consequence. Government rates were the same or less than the ICC-regulated rates that were deteriorating the industry again. Government-controlled expenditures for locomotives and infrastructure limiting them to the greatest need, as determined by the government, and they would have preferred that nobody needed anything. Infrastructure and equipment deteriorated at a faster rate. Federal support of highways began with funding of improved roads for rural postal routes. That sounds reasonable, since the Constitution says that the government should establish post roads. In the 1920s, federal funding had increased to include farm-to-market rural roads. There again, that makes sense. The farmers needed to be able to get to, effectively, the railroad, which was their market back in those days, and the roads were terrible. In the 1930s, federal funding had increased to develop a national road system. Now, anybody who had enough money to buy a truck could be in business drive on the roads that the government was uh, building and compete with the railroads. In the 1950s, federal funding had increased to supplement the national road system with the interstate highway system, which exacerbated the competition that the railroads were receiving from the government-supported highways. In the 1950s, the U.S. government funded part of the St. Lawrence Seaway in direct competition with several railroads. In the 1930s, the U.S. government began funding air traffic control. In the 1940s, the U.S. government expanded air traffic control funding from airway routes to airways and terminals. In the 1950s, the U.S. government initiated a large-scale technological advancement in air traffic control facilities. It's interesting to note that big government expenditures on air traffic control technological change in the 1950s was a result of a 1956 collision of two airliners over the Grand Canyon. The U.S. government has required the railroad industry to implement signal systems in the name of safety, at its own expense, of course, three times since 1920. The last was in response to a collision in Chatsworth, California in 2008. Along the way, local regulation, competition from state and U.S. government road construction, and the influence of motor vehicle and oil companies virtually eliminated interurban and city street railways. We are now beginning to restore some of these lines as light rail projects at a very substantial cost, much, much in excess of what it would have cost to just upgrade existing facilities. Oscar Wilde observed that no good deed goes unpunished, and he's right, at least in some cases. The U.S. government imposed a railroad passenger ticket tax from 1942 until 1962 and a freight waybill tax from 1942 until 1958. These funds helped the U.S. government fund the railroad's competition that it was building. State taxes on railroad property also contributed to the competition. After helping to put the railroads out of business, the U.S. government came to the rescue. Rescue was necessary because most of the Midwest and Northeast Railroad networks suffered economic collapse simultaneously. That wasn't exactly in the plan. Amtrak was the first step. ICC had required railroads to operate passenger trains that 
under conditions imposed by ICC, were losing money. The formation of Amtrak in 1971 removed the responsibility for passenger trains from the railroad, but they had to maintain the current operating conditions for them. That wasn't enough to restore service levels. It merely maintained the status quo. Well, kind of partially maintained. The first day of Amtrak operation included discontinuing 256 passenger trains that had been in operation the day before. Some cities and towns lost all but one train. Some lost all service. In some cities, the only service was in the middle of the night. Many day trips became impossible because it was impossible to go at a reasonable time or not return at a reasonable time or not return at all. The idea was to free the railroads of the expense of operating passenger service, let it die a slow death on its own, and disguise it as rescue. Conrail, a corporation owned by the U.S. government, took over the assets and operation of seven bankrupt railroads in 1976. Unlike the ICC-regulated railroads, Conrail was free at its formation to abandon routes it did not want, leading to the abandonment of many routes that were called redundant because they did not figure into the big picture of endpoints-only planning and creating profitability without regard to surface implications. The Railroad Revitalization and Regulatory Reform Act of 1980, known as the Staggers Act, deregulated the remaining railroads, allowing them to negotiate and set rates, and simplifying the merger and abandonment process. So now we have a healthy railroad industry. Well, healthier at least. Using data readily available from the United States Surface Transportation Board, the STB, as an example, statistics for all North American Class I railroads for 2007 show an industry-wide return on investment of 8.59%. STB makes a judgment for each year of the revenue adequacy of railroads in the U.S. The last available decision reflects the year 2005. Six of the seven Class I railroads in the U.S. made return on investment of 5.89 to 10.32 percent. One Class I railroad made a return on investment of 13.21 percent. When compared to the cost of capital, 12.2% for the industry in 2005, only one railroad was declared revenue adequate by the STB. And as a fun exercise, bring a business plan to a bank asking for a loan when you say that you expect to have a revenue of less than the cost of capital. U.S. passenger service was inadequate, obsolete, and severely deteriorated by the time that Amtrak came to the um, rescue. It has not improved much. The U.S. rail network was inadequate, obsolete, and severely deteriorated by the time the Staggers Act came to the rescue. It is not as deteriorated as it was. The Staggers Act rescued the railroad industry, not railroad transportation. Like any other private corporation, the U.S. railroad industry determines what business is the most profitable and limits its service to that sector. Transportation of other commodities lesser amounts or lesser distance is refused in one way or another left to be handled by road. As common carriers, the railroads really can't refuse anything. However, they can filter what traffic that they get by the level of service that they offer or the price that they charge for transportation. The degree of benefit of the service to society is not a consideration. Railroads make use of the government-assisted highway competition, assuming that profit can be maximized if a large part of the haul is by truck. Moving freight by truck for 500 to 700 miles to reach a railroad for the intermediate part of the trip is considered normal. Passenger service is typically relegated to poor performance or is required to provide huge infrastructure investment in return for low to moderate service level. The business, political, and economic environment affects the adequacy of the infrastructure for more than long, heavy, and frequent freight service. Other factors affect the efficiency and reliability of both freight and passenger service. The picture is different in Europe. European countries have recognized railroads as an important asset for many years. 
Railroads have been owned and operated by the governments until recently. Recent privatization in most countries keeps the infrastructure in the hands of the government and opens the operation of trains to competition. DB Netze, the German rail infrastructure operator, a government corporation, manages the infrastructure for the competitive operation of trains of DB, the German train operator, a government corporation, and hundreds of other open access train operating companies. The arrangement promotes continual improvement in infrastructure and operation, and therefore the general state of rail transportation. The European rail system is not without significant problems, but it is far more developed and appropriate for 21st century requirements than the American system. Granted, the U.S. is not Europe, and the European model can't be just plugged in here, but looking into what works there and why is a worthwhile activity, especially if practices improving our own system can be developed. So how about a healthy rail transportation system? How do we find the road to better utilization of rail transportation in the U.S.? As a result of the Staggers Act, new management came to the railroad industry from other fields. By nature, rail transportation is complex. It can be bewildering to somebody from the outside. Industry management of the 80s assumed that existing practices were causing the problems that put the railroads into a deplorable state. New, simplified practices were instituted effectively treating rail transportation management like the management of truck transportation. Carefully planned operation was left behind for improvised operation. It all worked because rail traffic had diminished to almost nothing. It is easy to improvise the operation of a virtually empty railroad and get away with it. It appeared to be the right thing to do, at least at the time. The huge increase in demand for rail transportation that began in the 1990s took the industry by surprise. The new ways of the 80s could not sustain the traffic levels of the beginning of the 21st century, resulting in industry-wide meltdowns. Only the economic slowdown of the past six years or so has rescued the industry from its lack of railroad operating expertise, although recent problems with the volume of oil being shipped by rail have had a significant effect. The changes that are needed to fulfill the potential of rail transportation in the U.S. are not easily developed or accomplished. We need to change the political, business, and economic climate for rail transportation. We need to learn how to take full advantage of the natural environmental benefits of rail transportation. Don't categorize rail infrastructure, service, and business into traditional passenger, traditional freight, and traditional transit. Think outside of the constraints of the American box and innovate and make the best use of the ecological characteristics of rail transportation. Oil consumption, emissions, land use patterns, dependence on foreign countries, not all of them exactly friendly to us or stable, the consequences of highway accidents, and the consequences of highway congestion and the current state of rail transportation are directly or indirectly, a result of U.S. government transportation policy over the past 130 years. Government, national, state, and local, has assumed the role of passenger rail service provider. As a result, government agencies have invested substantially in rail infrastructure in some parts of the country in order to provide or improve passenger service. Railroad companies stand to receive significant benefit from passenger improvements under the cover of being kept whole and not having their operation degraded by passenger service. Can't blame them for that. The infrastructure, precision, and discipline necessary for functional passenger service is the same infrastructure, precision, and discipline needed for innovative freight service that will get trucks off the highways. Why not be honest about it? Railroads have a huge investment in property and infrastructure, nationalizing the infrastructure to make the needed improvements and provide the needed services is not feasible. We we'll learned that in World War I. Rail shippers, especially those who ship by train load, push for open access, allowing competition for their business, or so they say. Railroad companies are afraid of this concept for obvious reasons, competitors and the shippers themselves taking the most profitable business for a potentially unreasonable infrastructure charge. 
Considering history, the fear is not unreasonable. This has no easy solution. STB has imposed competitive trackage rights in recent merger approvals. Enlarging the scope of this type of arrangement will be difficult. Passenger service is supported by government investment in private infrastructure for public benefit. Many get the trucks off the highway services are also for public benefit. Government investment in private infrastructure should be acceptable for these services as well. Track owners, in exchange for their ownership position, should have right of first refusal for services for public benefit for which public infrastructure investment has been made. It is all a matter of a difficult but necessary change in national transportation policy. One last important element that needs to occur before all of this can be put into place. The lack of railroad operating expertise is directly related to the lack of railroad education in the U.S. Railroads are a complex transportation technology. Decades ago, the knowledge was passed from one generation to another through forms of apprenticeship. That was decades ago. There is now virtually no education in rail transportation technology in the U.S. There's training in how to do specific jobs, but virtually no education. Two universities have a rail engineering program. Others have some individual courses in rail business management and engineering. Germany, with a population of 25% of that of the U.S., has 11 universities with railroad engineering programs. All engineering students are required to take the fundamental railroad courses. If desired, a student may pursue a degree in railroad engineering. In the U.S., railroads train their new employees in management. That is, train, is in prepare them for a specific job or activity rather than educate, which is presenting the information needed for an understanding of the workings of the system. Rail engineering consulting companies typically train newly graduated and hired engineers or those that they've hired who have no railroad experience as needed. Serious effort at fully utilizing the benefits of rail transportation will require serious effort at providing education in railroad operations and engineering for operating employees and managers as well as engineers.